Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is Yasin, and in this video, I'm going to share with you three critical business tips from Steve Jobs. If you're planning to start a business, or if your business is not doing so well, Steve Jobs was a great marketer, and he arguably was the king of sales. He started most other big businesses to create his own business platform. In this video, I'm going to share with you three business tips that I learned from Steve Jobs actually watching his videos and reading his books and I'm also recommending to you as well if you're planning to start your own business okay starting a business doesn't have any special formula you create your own business formula and now let's jump into the video the group of people that do not use quality in their marketing are the Japanese you never see them using quality in their marketing it's only the American companies that do and yet if you ask people on the street which products have the best reputation for quality, they will tell you the Japanese products. Now, why is that? How could that be? The answer is because customers don't form their opinions on quality from marketing. They don't form their opinions on quality from who won the, uh, the Deming Award or who won the Baldrige Award. They form their opinions on quality from their own experience with the products or the services. And so, one can spend enormous amounts of money on quality. One can win every quality award there is, and yet if your products don't live up to it, customers will not keep that opinion for long in their minds. And so I think where we have to start is with our products and our services, not with our marketing department. And we need to get back to the basics and go improve our products and services. Now again, quality isn't just the product or the service, it's having the right product you know, knowing where the market's going and having the most innovative products is just as much a part of quality as the quality of the construction of the product when you have it. And I think what we're seeing is the quality leaders of today have integrated that quality technology well beyond their manufacturing, now going well into their sales and marketing and out as far as they can to touch the customer and trying to, to create super efficient processes back from the customer all the way through to the delivery of the end product so that they can have the most innovative products, understand the customer needs fastest. I mean, you guys, most of you come from companies where you've had work experience, right? How many of you are from manufacturing companies? Oh, excellent. Where, where are the rest of you from? <laughs> oh, how many from consulting? Oh, that's bad. <laughs> you should do something. No, ser seriously. I, I don't think there's anything inherently evil in consulting. I think that <laughs> I think that without without owning something uh, over an extended period of time, like a few years, where one has a chance to take responsibility for one's recommendations, where one has to see one's recommendations through all action stages and accumulate scar tissue for the mistakes and pick oneself up off the ground and dust oneself off, uh, one learns a fraction uh, of what one can. What, you're, you're coming in and making recommendations and not owning the results, not owning the implementation, um, I think is, is uh, a fraction of the, of the value and a fraction of the opportunity to learn and get better. <coughs> And so what, what you, you do get a broad cut at companies, but it's very thin. It's like a picture of a, I, would, I could use, I'm a vegetarian, so I won't use steak, but it's like a picture of a, of a banana. Uh, it, you might get a very accurate picture, but it's only two-dimensional. And without the experience of actually doing it, you never get three-dimensional. So you might have a lot of pictures on your walls. You can show it off to your friends. You can say, oh, look, I've worked in bananas, I've worked in peaches, I've worked in <laughs> grapes. But you never really taste it. And, and I think that, that um, that's, that's what I think. There's a really interesting book that was written by a guy named uh, Paul Strassman. And Paul has one of the more interesting jobs on the planet. He's this chief information officer, CIO of a very large organization called the Pentagon. And uh, they really understand software there. I had a conversation with him not too long ago, and he said the, the lesson from the Gulf War was that the best, the best software will win the war. And so they're trying to do a lot of work in the software area. And, um, 
He wrote a book, though, before he got this job called The Business Value of Computers. And it's rather thick and it's not good bedtime reading, but you can plow through it and there's some incredible stuff in it. And one, he asked two questions in particular. Uh, one was he surveyed a bunch of companies uh, from not very successful all the way up to really successful. And there's somebody taking notes here. And, uh, <laughs> and he asked, he asked how much they spent on information technology as a percentage of revenues. And he got a very counterintuitive answer, right? You'd think that either the really successful companies would either spend more or less than the not successful companies, depending on your theory. But it was exactly the same. They all spent about 2% of revenues on information technology. And he found this curious, and so he asked another question. How do they spend their money? And he found out that the, uh, the really successful ones, or actually, let's start with the not so successful ones. Uh, as we, success increases uh, and dollars increase, he found out that the not so successful ones spent the majority of their money on management productivity. And the more successful ones spent the majority of their money on operational productivity applications, right? Now, this was not very pleasant for me to read because I spent the first 10 years of my life on management productivity, uh, which was PCs, right? PCs and Macs never attacked operational productivity. They just attacked management productivity. Why is that? Because you can't go down to your local computer store and buy an app that will help you do stock trading or will help you uh, run a hospital or will help you um, in whatever operational part of your business you want to automate, right? Unless you're a very, very small business, then you could run some accounting packages. But other than that, if you're a medium-sized or large business, these things never attacked operational productivity. So we zoom out and we say, how have people attacked operational productivity with information technology? Well, in the 60s, they bought a mainframe and they got some terminals and a bunch of COBOL programmers and they wrote a few apps. And most of them were kind of backroom apps. And it sort of worked for the very few that could afford to do this. In the 70s, they got a mainframe and some terminals and they did the same thing. And a few of them got a few mini computers and terminals and tried to do it a little cheaper. In the 80s, Nothing changed. Mainframe and terminals, minis and terminals, until maybe about two or three years ago. What happened two or three years ago was that the front office started to realize that they needed operational apps so bad that they couldn't depend on, on the MIS folks anymore. And they started taking life into their own hands and working with, sometimes working with the MIS folks, to start downsizing and getting some servers and running some industry standard databases like Sybase or Oracle in the servers and making a little local area network and getting maybe some Sun workstations and spending about two years writing some mission critical operational applications like trading apps for Wall Street, perfect example. And it kind of worked. And the reason that they needed to do this was because more and more they were discovering that Things like new products required an, a, a custom operational application. An example, if you're in financial services and you come up with a new product, it's only three things. It's an idea, it's a sales force, and it's a custom app to bang on databases to make the product real, to do the mortgage swaps or whatever it is you want to do. Without the app, you don't have a product. And so there's been a increasing buildup of demand from the front parts of corporations to create more and more and more of these operational applications. And I think it's going to get to the point where this becomes fairly clear that this is the next big revolution in desktop computing, is to create these, to attack the operational productivity and as we start to re-engineer the way we do things, to automate a lot of this in custom applications. Sounds a little strange now to most people. Sounds like desktop publishing did in 1985. Nobody knew what it was. Everybody thought it was kind of a strange vertical thing over there. But my guess is it's pretty horizontal. And we're attacking vertical markets now that know they want this. Uh, and it's going extremely well. Sun is the only company that's really had any success at this and we're knocking them out of the box because we came up with the software called Next Step 
which lets you build apps five to ten times faster than anything anyone's ever seen. And after you build them, they're deployable and usable by mere mortals, because it's really easy to use, this computer. And you can interoperate your custom apps seamlessly with a bunch of off-the-shelf productivity apps. So we go to these companies that uh, use Suns and take two years to write their apps, or are thinking about using Suns, and they can write their apps in about 90 days on the next. Now, if you're on Wall Street and you can write, you can create a new product in 90 days versus your competitor in two years, that's eight new products you can field for their every one. And you can start to see the competitive advantage that can be created this way. Now, we had no idea that we were any good at this when we started Next. Um, a lot of times you don't know what your competitive advantage is when you launch a new product. Let me give you a historical example. When we created the, how many of you guys use Macs? Maybe? Good. <laughs> how many of you have seen a Next? Oh, that's, how many of you use a Next? Oh, that's not so bad. Uh, we'd like to change that ratio. <laughs> We're on the right track anyway. We, um, when we started, when we did the Macintosh, we never anticipated desktop publishing when we created the Mac sounds funny because that turned out to be the Mac's compelling advantage, right? The thing that it did not one and a half or two times better than everything else, but you know, four or five times better than anything else where you had to have one. We never anticipated it. We anticipated bitmap displays and laser printers, but we never thought about PageMaker or that whole industry really coming down to the desktop. Maybe we weren't smart enough. But we were smart enough to see it start to happen nine to 12 months later. And we changed our entire marketing and business strategy to focus on desktop publishing. And it became the Trojan horse that eventually got the Mac into corporate America, where it could show its owners all the other wonderful things it could do. Likewise, when we created Next Step, this revolutionary object-oriented software that we have, our target customer coming from the PC world, where shrink-wrapped apps were king, was Lotus and Adobe and WordPerfect and all the shrink wrap apps developers. And the purpose was to let them create their apps five to ten times faster, these shrink wrapped apps. And it worked. We have a ton of shrink wrapped apps now, I'm best of breed in almost every category. But it wasn't until early in 91, early last year, a little over a year ago, that some really big companies came to us and said, You don't understand what you've got. The same software that allows Lotus to create their apps five to ten times faster, is letting us build our in-house mission critical apps five to ten times faster. And this is the biggest problem we've had. This is a huge problem for every big company and almost all medium-sized companies, and you have the solution in your hands and you dummies don't even know it. And it took them about three months before we finally heard it. Uh, and in last summer, we changed our whole sales and marketing strategy around to focus on that, and it's taken off like a rocket. And uh, we grew about 4x last year and probably grow about 2x this year. And our customer list is, is now very, very strong and, and growing like crazy. We just got back from spending a few days in DC and in New York, and uh, we're talking to customers we only dreamed of talking to a, a year ago. So that's what we do. And um, our arch enemy son, they want to kill us, uh, which is good. They, they should try to do that as soon as possible, because the sooner they do it, the cheaper it will be for them. But they won't see <laughs> I think it's gone past the point where it's possible. And they can't, the, the greatest thing is hardware is really, hardware churns every 18 months. It's pretty impossible to get a sustainable competitive advantage from hardware. Um, if you're lucky, you can make something one and a half or two times as good as your competitor, which probably isn't enough to be quite a competitive advantage, and it only lasts for six months. But software seems to take a lot longer for people to catch up with. Um, I watched Microsoft take eight or nine years to catch up with the Mac, and it's arguable whether they've even caught up. Um, it takes a long time. We think that the soonest we're going to have a true competitor is probably four to five years. So we've got that amount of time to grow ourselves a one to two billion dollar company so that we can compete with them on scale. See, today we can't compete with them on scale. We never have as many salespeople as they do, as Sun does. We don't have the ad budgets that they do. So we've got to have a better product. 
assuming, and I hope we always have a better product, and I think we can, but I'd also like to be able to at least give them a run for their money on scale. So we've got the next three to four years to run really fast so that by the time they even get close to having a competitive product, we're at a large enough scale to where we can start to compete with them. And that's what we're doing with our lives right now. Spending a lot of time with customers, spending a lot of time making Next Step better, and uh, that kind of thing. So that's the strategic basis of what we do. Does that make any sense to you? Um, have you run across the concept of sort of operational custom applications at all? I mean, you guys, most of you have come from companies where you've had work experience, right? And you've all done that. So do you, do you have this problem in the companies you've come from? Of a lot of pressure to write these operational custom applications and hardly anything coming out of the spigot to satisfy this thirst? <laughs>